and create if selected value equals yen, all right, and we're going to have to add to all those if statements that are already there. What if converted value equals yen? All right, or DD2 selected value equals yen. So we got a lot of work to do for every one that we add. And what's worse is the more currencies we add, the tougher it's going to get. In other words, we add yen, all right, what do we have to do? We have to, as far as the if statements go, we have to add a new if block and change three if blocks. So we got one new if block, three changes there. What if we add rubles then, in addition to yen? Well, we have our one new block, we then have four if statements we have to change, and so on and so on. So the more that we add, the more changes we have to make, all right, which, I don't know, that sounds like an awful lot of work, especially when we think that really the statement is just this simple. Converted amount Somehow I'm going to blame my bad typing on my camp too. I haven't figured that one out yet, but equals amount times rate. You see, this is what drives me nuts when computers do things for you. It's like, I want to do it wrong. Let me do it wrong. Okay, I'll do this then. Jeez. Double. Great. Yeah, and I was going to tell me you're trying to use it before it's initialized. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> At least let me type it in and didn't insist on changing it to dollar rate. This is the only instruction to do the conversion, right? right? The only thing that's different in all these cases is what the rate is. So, what if I have a function that says get rate? All right, rate equals get rate. What am I going to have to tell that function to get the rate? What your starting currency is, what your ending currency is. Right. I need to tell it two things. I need to tell it what currency I'm starting with and what currency I want to convert to. Where do I get the currency I'm starting with from? DD from dot selected value. All right. Where am I getting the other currency from? DD2 selected value. Then I can chop off all this code. And all I got to do is write a function to do that. Now, let's think in terms of maintainability here. Even before we write this function, so I'll put in a function. Actually, no, I won't. I will put
I'm going to lie. And I'm going to say, I'm going to put in a conversion rate of 0.63. And I'll tell you why I'm going to do that in a minute. Okay. Now, let's say I'm only interested in the button click event. I trust that the calculation of the rate works right. If I'm only interested in the button click event, look how easy that code is to read now in the button click event. There's only a handful of instructions. Real easy to get my head around. I don't have this giant set of if statements that um, muddy the water here. All right? If I'm interested, if there's an issue with the rate, I can look at the rate function, which right now doesn't really do anything, right? It, it just returns 0.63. Now, eventually, these, these lines are going to go into here. All right. Is that, I hope that's just a warning. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to run this. I'm going to say $22 is how many pounds? 13.86, 13.86. What did I do there? I hard-coded the value for pounds. Why did I do that? To see if the connection between this and this worked. To make sure I'm calling the function right. All right? This, in the old days, we called this writing a stub function. A stub function sort of pretends like it's doing its job. In other words, I'm not really calculating the rate. I'm pretending to calculate the rate. So if I went in and said convert euros to dollars, it isn't going to do it right because it's not really calculating the rate. It's pretending to do that. But I can make sure that at the very least, you know, things are talking to each other. I'm calling the function, getting the answer back, and displaying it. So, what does this mean for, say, your tuition example? Let's say you have a function to calculate tuition. Now, if you notice, there's a little um, irregularity in the chart. That is, for Credit hours 1 through 12 is simply a flat rate. You multiply the number of credit hours times a certain rate. There's a certain rate for Lorain County resident. There's a certain rate for um, out of county, certain rate for out of state. If I was writing a stub function for that, I might take the hours and the residency status, calculate the rate, and multiply them and just return that value. That's not the whole solution, right? It doesn't take into account the fact that 13 through 18 credit hours get the same amount. But at least it's a start. I'm not trying to tackle the whole problem all at once. I can make sure that then I'm talking to the function correctly, and I'm getting the values I need to, and I'm passing it to the function, and I'm getting a result back. All right? And therefore, um, it's a big improvement. Right, it's a big improvement in, in that regard. And I, I, can, I can make progress before I'm ready to be complete. Again, I encourage students, and, and a lot of students are very resistant to take this advice because they want to get it done, and I can respect that. But, you know, you probably know from driving that a lot of times when you try to take the shortcut, you end up taking longer, right? If you try to just jump ahead and do everything all at once, thinking that's a quicker way to get it down, the problems that you run into are going to more than make up, and they're going to be problems that are relatively harder to find because you're looking in a big chunk of code. So therefore, do a tiny bit at a time. And that might involve faking a stub function. All right. In other words, this isn't the real function yet, but at least I can test and make sure that these things are talking to each other. So if I run into a problem later, I know, hey, the problem is with this function. All right? Okay. So, how do we 
calculate the conversion rate? Well, depends on what we're starting with and what we're going to, right? So it depends on these factors. Essentially, we're going to divide these two, one of, two of these things by each other, all right? So, divide it. So, if arg from equals dollars then Rate from equals dollar rate. If arg from equals pounds, Same thing for two. So what's the conversion rate then? Well, we know from dollars to pounds, it would be multiply 0.63. In other words, what we did is we took the pound rate, or the two rate, divided by the from rate. It does not like the fact that these if statements could have gone through uh, without giving a value for that, so I'll initialize these guys as 1. All right, now we, we're good to go. Now, equals how many pounds? 6.93. 6.93. We have a winner. Euros to pounds. 9.24. Uh-oh. Something ain't working. Sometimes, yeah, maybe it was, maybe it was. Let's go and save this and try this. So $1, $11 equals how many euros? 
8.25? 11. Okay, that's right. So. I wonder if it's the old uh, S on the hero like you did before. Pardon me? Around before you used your rows instead of your rows. Well, you know what? We could guess at that. But what do you suppose I'm going to do? Breakpoint. 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 Because you know, if you haven't figured it out by now, you know every time I make a mistake in class is to illustrate some point. Because I, I certainly wouldn't just accidentally make a mistake and type something in wrong. <laughs> All right, let's go and run this. It looked to me like everything was working except Euro conversion. So you're probably right. Well, I just saw it when you popped it up. Oh, plus yeah. <laughs> it's not the S, though. No. Oh, okay. You, you capitalized everything in Euro. All right. So is the arg rate from, is the arg from dollars? Yes, it is. So that part is right. So I'm stepping through. It's going to set the rate from to that. None of these other statements are right. R2 dollars, no. Is R2 euro? Oh, no, it's not. It's lowercase. So therefore, it has the initialized value, which was 1. But at least it didn't blow up. So now I can go here and change that to euro. Change that to euro. And I should be in business. show up only under certain conditions. So if I'm doing regression testing, what I want to have is I want to have a bunch of test cases. T test cases. All right? In other words, this worked on Tuesday. I could have a spreadsheet that says, or a, a document that says, here's what I'm going to test when I change this. I'm going to test to make sure that if I put nothing in, it doesn't break. I'm going to, put, well, I'm going to test when I put a non-numeric number, it doesn't break. Then I'm going to test dollar to dollar, dollar to pound, dollar to euro, pound to dollar, pound to pound, pound to euro. Lastly, uh, euro to dollar, euro to pound, euro to euro. And I'll have calculations in there that says and show what the result should be. So I can run through the test and I can see is it right or is it wrong. And I can rigorously test all the possibilities. Um, for that, as opposed to just, you know, banging on the keyboard just trying some things. What if I didn't pick euro in that case? Or what if the problem wasn't with the from, but it was only with the to, or vice versa? I could leave a bug in there that, that would come out only under certain circumstances. Now, this is something straightforward. This is like with like nine combinations. That's a small number of combinations, right? When you get to bigger applications, think of all the different possibilities that you could branch through. You know, think of a payroll application. You know, what determines your pay? There's a lot of things that determine your pay, right? Whether you're hourly or salary, whether you've worked overtime or not, how many dependents you have, what city you live in. All these things are factors that, you know, you go a million different ways possibly through the payroll calculation, which is why there's bugs in software. But our job is to first of all write maintainable code to cut that down and secondly be rigorous about our testing. Have a test plan that you've devised to test your code. All right, now let's look at this. This code 
itself looks pretty sweet. There's no way I'm improving that, right? I mean, kind of hard to get rid of anything in this in this one, right? In this one, let's think about what we'd have to do if a rate changed. If a rate changed, we just go and change it up here, all right? And, and we're done, all right? So that's pretty good. What if we were to add a new currency? What if we were to add a yen to this? Well, we'd have to add the rate for yen, okay? We'd have to add an if statement for the from and an if statement for the to. So we'd have to add, put in a rate and two if statements. If you remember before, we would have had to change the rate, add an if statement, and change three if statements. So already we're ahead of the game. Now let's think if we were to add rubles on that list. All right, what would we have to do? We'd have to add a rate, we'd have to add an if statement for the from, an if statement for the to. So, Instead of doing like we did before, where we have to add one if statement and changing four if statements, we only have to add two if statements. So we're, we've made measurable improvements. This isn't just me saying that it's easier, all right? We can actually play in our head what we would need to do to change this, and we can see there's less coding changes to do, all right? There's less coding changes to do if we were to code this this way as opposed to even the last iteration. Question? All right. But can we do better? Probably. Let's think about how we could do better. One of the ways we could do better is we could put this in a class. Um, that we may or may not get to today. Probably won't get to that today. Probably get to that on Wednesday. How could we make this code here better?
something of light. Array, thank you. <laughs> if we made this a number, if we made this a number, then we could use that number as a subscript to the array. And we could eliminate that code. So let me go and let me go and rework the drop down. So let me go and rework the drop down. This unfortunately is going to break the old calculation unless we go back and retrofit it. Excuse me, Mike, are you going to put this on the, this code on the, uh, an angel? Have I put every example that we've done in class in angel? Yeah. So, sure so remind me, though, because if this machine goes off, then, then yeah, you're right. I have, I have screwed up in the past. So, all right. I'm going to copy this drop down, and I'm going to paste a new drop down in here. Actually, no, never mind. I'll just break the old code. I'll leave it, well, whatever, we'll figure it out. Um, so I'm going to go and edit this drop down. I'm going to edit the items. And I'm going to make dollars instead of having a value of dollars. I'm going to make it have a value of zero. I'm going to make euro have a value of one. And I'm going to have, make pounds have a value of two. I'm going to do the same thing to this drop down. So now, I have my drop down is going to return to 0, 1, and 2. So, I can use that to look at an array and pull out that element. How do I make an array in C-sharp? What is an array, first of all, for those of you that never used arrays? Does everyone know what an array is? Let me ask that. Collection of objects. Yeah, an array is a list or a collection of objects. And... Typically, a variable can only have one value, whereas an array, think of it as a list of values, which means that to refer to an element in, array, in an array, I, um, refer to, uh, I have to refer to which element, so I have to supply a subscript. So let's go in and C sharp. This is what I want. Creating an array. 